personally, I call them um, historical fiction of another world. And I will then emphasize to people that they read like fantasy, but feel like history, which I've been told by many people that they do feel like history. I would still tend towards calling them historical fantasy and argue with people who say that fantasy has to have magic. But in my world, the fantasy is the societies. Their speculative fiction is really what they are. Do you love science fiction and fantasy books? You found yourself in the right dimension. Welcome to the greatest podcast in the multiverse, where each week I talk to science fiction and fantasy authors about myth, magic, and the infinite possibilities of storytelling. I'm your host, Herman Stuernagel, and I will be taking you on a journey with some of your favorite authors, helping you to get to know them and possibly uncover some new literary gems along the way. Ready to explore? Because on this show, every conversation is a doorway into a different world. So welcome once again to the greatest podcast in the multiverse. I am so excited to have with me today, Marion Thorpe. Welcome here, Marion. You are very welcome. I am glad to have you here. Um, can you get us started a little bit, Marion, and just tell us a little bit about yourself and about your writing journey? Okay, well, this writing is a third career for me. Um, I spent oh, 15 years or so getting a master's degree in agricultural science, crop breeding and genetics, and working as a research associate at a university. Hmm. Uh, and then I switched careers completely and became a high school teacher. Um, I did that in various forms for about 25 years. I was a classroom teacher and then I was a regional specialist. Uh, then I retired and um, I'd been writing all that time, but not terribly seriously until I reached my late thirties and um, published my first book the year I retired. And 10 years, almost 10 years later, nine years later, it's uh, the eighth book's coming out in February. Pretty, that's pretty cool. So in, so 10 years of publishing, you have eight books out then? Well, eight books in February, yes. Eight books in February, wonderful. Wonderful, that's exciting. Um, so, and you said you were writing the entire time. Um, were you writing novels? Do you have, did you have other projects that are in a drawer somewhere? I have, yes. Um, I've, I've, I've started my first novel when I was 17. Um, cool. Not, a, not, not, uh, that unsurprising, unsur but it was supposed to be the great Canadian novel. I wasn't writing science fiction or fantasy at that point. <laughs> and um, of course, I never finished it. Um, interestingly, though, some of the themes from it remain the themes of my books. Okay. So um, I've written, other than that one, I wrote two more or less complete uh, apprentice novels, um, which will never see the light of day. Mm. And, but my first published work, um, seriously published other than university newspaper level publishing is uh, poetry. Mm. Um, I've also had short stories and essays, uh, nonfiction essays published as well, or, and, or, uh, performed at various, uh, jury, uh, writers contests and that sort of thing. So okay. it's pretty wide ranging actually, but, yeah. um, about, the late 90s, I started to write the book that became Empire's Daughter and basically went from there. Wow, well, yeah, that's awesome. You know what? I've had a lot of my guests that I actually got kind of their start in writing in poetry and short stories before they mm -hmm. moved on to, to novel writing. So that's, that's great to hear that your experience was similar. I think one of the advantages of starting with poetry, um, when in my case it was structured sonnets I was writing to a, to a, a verse form, is that it teaches you a lot about being concise mm. and also about exactly the right word choice and the importance of cadence and rhythm in yeah. writing, whether it's prose or poetry. Absolutely. Now, is that part of, sorry, and you said that was part of a university program that you had, you were publishing no. those in? Oh, okay. No, I was just doing that on my own. Okay. Yeah, I was just, I had, I did take a couple of poetry classes in university and they do teach you a lot about that structure and, and timing and, and that sort of thing. So. All my formal education is in areas other than writing. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Um, so now you've been writing this whole time and you've, you know, started publishing once you retired. What's the, uh, what is the why in your writing? What's the motivation behind your storytelling? It's an interesting question. I thought about that one a lot. I, my grandmother taught me to read. She was a very bored, retired teacher. So she taught me to read when I was three and I have read every, you know, ever since obviously. And I just think that 
for me, it was just that stories have been part of my life since then or since before then, because clearly people were reading to me. And it just the way my imagination was formed and, and the, the idea that stories could be told through a, a, in a written format, uh, it just became natural for me to want to replicate what you know, what I was doing, you right. know, what I was seeing and reading. So I, I mean, the first story I remember writing, I was probably about six or seven. So it, um, the why I, it's just, it's an integral part of me. I just need to write. Right. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Love of love, a lifelong love of story. Story and language. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, and so what does your writing process look like now? Um, do you write all day? Do you write every day? What does that look like for you? When I'm well into the flow of a novel, I write every day, um, every day that I can, but not all day. I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, um, my preferred way of writing now that I'm 65 and a bit and, and don't have the energy I had maybe even a decade ago is to write in the morning. Um, I tend to write between about... 7.30 until about 10.30. I try to get about a thousand words done in a day. Okay. And then I go for a walk or a bicycle ride if the weather permits, because right. I need to think about what I've written. I need to let those ideas flow and the next ideas come to me. And I do that best when I'm moving, either walking mm -hmm. or biking. And, okay. uh, but do I, I probably write five days out of seven, you know, life gets in the way. The other, <laughs> the demands of real life get in the way. Right. So, yeah. That's great. And now are you a plotter? Do you plot your stories out no. or no? Okay. No. Well, yes and no. I mean, I have a rough idea about what the story's about. Uh, I should say that this has evolved. I had absolutely no idea what Empire's Daughter was about. I, nor really the second book, the third book I have a somewhere in my files, I have the story arc I thought it was going to follow. Uh, which is now a source of much amusement. Um, <laughs> the basic idea is there, but no, I didn't. The characters didn't stick to what I wanted them to do. Right. So I have roughly, usually now I have an idea about what the book's about. And consistently since the first successful novel uh, that I finished, I know what the ending is. I write the ending about a third of the way in, somewhere okay. between a quarter and a third of the way into the book. Okay. And I have actually never changed them significantly. I've changed really? the word here or there, but I've never really changed what happens. Okay. And then I basically, my characters get me from place A to place B. I, I joke that I, I have an idea what is going to, what happens, what the setting is, what the, what the may, and usually what the conflict is at the time, whether big or small. And I give them to my characters and they do um, improv <laughs> and I write down what they do. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That's what, oh man. I, that's, I, I experienced that as well. You know, for the, I, I struggle with endings normally, um, but for my latest book, I actually knew the ending first and I mm -hmm. ended up writing that down. But unlike you, I had to go back and change it once I got actually to the mm. end because so much so many details had changed by the time I got there that right. it had yeah. the, the concept was there but it significantly changed yeah yeah so what other authors have inspired you well that's there's a long list yeah <laughs> let's start with the one that inspires lots of us J.R.R. <laughs> Tolkien okay but not maybe for the reasons that he inspired a lot of people. Um, as we, as you know, there's no magic in my books. I'm not writing magical fantasy. Right. Uh, the two things that probably inspired me with Tolkien is one is this, is his books are deeply, deeply rooted in the British countryside, mm. and my books are deeply rooted in the landscape in which they happen, even though it's semi-fictional. But the other is um, there's a quote by a poet. Uh, British poet named A.F. Harold um, that says that Tolkien shows us what the best hearted books show, the life beyond the adventure, the pedestrian day to day, the normalcy, the place where the real soul resides. Mm. And I really like that quote because you do see that in, in Lord of the Rings, you Absolutely. know, especially towards the end, but in other places in the books, you just see the everyday life of, of, of people. Right. And, I try to do that too. That was, I, I really noticed that in the books and I try to reflect that. Um, so that's really where his influence, the two things, the, the landscape and the, and that normalcy of everyday life. 
Mm -hmm. Beyond him, um, my biggest influences would be Mary Stewart and her Merlin, uh, well, trilogy, although there's more than the, the first three, the best of them. Uh, there's a obscure now um, American fantasy writer named Elizabeth Lynn, who wrote uh, a series of books in the late 70s, early 80s. Yeah, the Chronicles of Turner, and um, there's a couple of others that okay. were really influential in my world, in my society building, not so much my world building. Okay. And then the master of historical fantasy that is only a touch, a, a quarter turn toward the fantastic from the real world, Guy Gavriel Kay, who is a Canadian writer. For those who don't know him, you should. <laughs> and uh, basically, the first time I read one of his books that are set um, in the almost Europe in which he writes, I, that sort of said, oh, you can do that. <laughs> and, so I owe him a big uh, debt for the whole concept of building a semi-fictional world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a big name here in Canada, but not not so much elsewhere. Maybe. Yeah, not, yeah. Not sure. That's but, right. Yeah. Which is a pity, really. But yeah, lots of talent for sure. So, can you tell us a bit about your series um, and what it's all about? Yeah, um, not quickly. <laughs> that's that's fine. <laughs> um, Empire Empire's Legacy, which is really the overall. Uh, name of the series is a book on the surface about a young woman who lives in a society in a country that looks a lot like England, um, but whose society is very different. Women and men live completely separate lives. Um, after the age of seven, boys are taken for, with, by, to, by their father or his representative to join the uh, cadet schools and then the army. And uh, women do fish, farm, do everything else. And twice a year, they meet up with the men to ensure that there's another generation. Mm. Uh, it's a very um, traditional society from the point of view that these two things are separate. Women do not fight. Men do not do anything other than fight uh, with a very few exceptions. But in the face of invasion, um, they, the leaders of the country realize that they can't win a two-sided invasion without the help of the women. And they ask the women to learn to fight, which is the, the uh, inciting incident for the whole series. Okay. And it, the story carries Lena through from 18 when she decides that, yes, she has to defend her country to the uh, which divides her from her partner because Maya does not want any part of this. Women do not fight. And uh, she accepts exile from her village versus learning to fight. And it takes the that concept of um, a changing world and a changing uh, response to that world up until you know, Lena's in this final book is 51 and her world has yet is changing yet again. Um, uh, in the flow of the story, um, it becomes necessary for them, for her and other, other people by then to search for the mythical Eastern Empire, which is effectively Rome, but okay. um, or more or less Rome, Rome Byzantium sort of combined, uh, to ask for help after, against an even more severe invasion. And the cost and personal and political cost of becoming a, a province of now of the Eastern Empire. So it looks at that a little bit about the loss of freedom of her country, what that means. And then towards in this last book, which is called Empire's Passing, reflects in a very uh, foggy way, because it's nothing near, nowhere near the reality, but the, the period in 410, when Britain asked Rome for help for... Um, again and for against an invasion and Rome said look to your own defenses mm. and so they have been in that 30 year period that the books cover they have gone to Castle, my fictional Rome asked for help been given the help become a colony and now Castle is leaving them on their own again after 30 but of course after 30 years 
lots of things have changed. A right. Lot of the politics of, the, of the, how people live, the politics, etc. So there's a lot more to it than that, but that's the overall story. Yeah, and a, a wide arcing story as well to cover a 30 year time span. Yeah. Um, now, so what was the inspiration for this series? Well, oddly enough, nothing to do with Rome. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so during the Second World War, Britain drafted women. And both my mother and my father's sister were, my mother wasn't drafted. I can't remember if my Aunt Catherine was or not. Uh, they joined the army. Um, and at the same time, my father's first cousin, who had married a Danish man, was living in Denmark. And she became part of the Danish resistance. And she had some fascinating stories to tell later in life uh, about that. But um, that, that aside... So what I was interested in growing up on these stories, at least as much as I would hear these stories, because both my mother and my Aunt Catherine had, assigned, had signed the Official Secrets Act, so they really still weren't talking about it very okay. much, but um, was the impact of women being asked to fight, or right. not to fight, but to be part of the army to free up men to fight. So they're right. asking to take on a role that they'd never taken on before. Um, you know, my mother was in uniform. She was, she was shipped to France. She was in France for a number of years. She was bombed. I mean, there was all sorts of things that mm. just were well beyond the experience of, of women in general. Right? right. So I wanted to look at that, but I wanted to look at it in a way. I didn't want to write another World War II novel. Right. Um, I'm not very good at being consigned or, uh, being having to stick to history. I mean, <laughs> now, come on, I want to, I want to make things up. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so that was, that was the real impetus behind it um, was to do that exploration. And then basically I thought, okay, if I'm going to do that, let's make this a really different society. Let's look at some other questions of, of, of societal freedoms and structure and, and beliefs. So I threw in a, Basically, Lena's world um, is uh, men and women live apart for most of their lives. Um, men and women are sexual beings. They are not, it is not a heterosexual, norm, heteronormative society. It's a society in which um, both men and women have uh, same sex relationships as well as their heterosexual relationships in general. Right. So it's, it's a very sexual sexually fluid society okay. so i wanted to look at that as well um, yeah and so so i sort of combined those two things and threw it into a landscape i love and uh went from there <laughs> yeah that sounds so fascinating to me and i love uh, both the inspiration behind it and really the the way that that structured your world now uh, obviously having men and women separate uh, you know for their entire lives creates a certain dynamic. How, uh, what kind of struggles did you run into in creating a world like that? And how did, um, I guess, tell us a little bit more about the dynamics in, in their culture. Okay, so, so we have in most of the books, there are two, there's a third culture, but it, they're not really a big part of the culture, but you have a world divided by a wall. And yes, I did this on purpose because I wanted that physical uh, um, metaphor as well as, as this actual reference to Hadrian's wall, hmm. you know? So, so the country north of the wall is a very traditional society um, where probably same-sex relationships <clears throat> between women are known to exist, but they're just tolerated because that's really doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, between men, they're absolutely forbidden. And uh, and south of the wall, you have a society where same-sex relationships are... It, it's a queer normative society south of the wall. Let's mm. put it, that's probably the simplest way to put it. Yeah. So that created some very interesting tensions as the books go on, um, simply because there is a love story between two men, for both from north of the wall, as well as a love story from south of the wall between Lena and one of those two men. So that in itself was an interesting uh, piece to write. But 
that's where Elizabeth Lynn's books came in were, as being highly influential because her world is very similar from that point of view. Um, these were some of the probably the most, the first really queer normative worlds uh, from the late 70s. Okay. And um, they, they, you know, they really did influence the way I looked at the world and hmm. what world I could create. So, but on top of that, I was pulling in echoes of things like the um, traditional or sort of the common garden variety view of Sparta where boys are taken off at seven to learn to fight. So I was pulling on that bit. The Sacred Band of Thebes, which were was a ancient uh, fighting force of of paired men who were in same sex relationships because it was believed that that actually made it as a stronger, stronger, uh, fighting force because mm. they were fighting for each other. Right. Um, so I just brought in a lot of those sorts of things. And okay. then, you know, some of the, some of it's pure imagination. Some of it reflects, you know, the world I'd like to see. Um, and, it yeah so it sort of created some interesting conflicts in the in for example in lena's world as it exists when she's a girl and again you, i write in first person so everything we see is through my protagonist's eyes mm -hmm. and so the world that she thinks she lives in when she's 18 isn't the world she lives in, but she's an 18 year old and that's all, all she knows is her fishing village. Yeah. Right. So as her world expands, as she travels, she learns more and more that the price of the, of the world that she, the, of the society that she lives in, because boys who don't want to fight or can't fight, who refuse to fight are castrated mm. because they don't want to, them to father children who may still want not to fight. You right. Know? Okay. Um, so there is this huge price for, for this world they've created. And she sort of learns that as she goes along. Um, and she learns, you know, that there's, look, there's a world here where, you know, I'm expected to be submissive to men and I'm not supposed to, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to marry and I'm supposed to have kids and wait a minute, I wasn't planning any of this. <laughs> right. Um, and at the same time, we have a side story of a man learning that outside of his or two men learning outside of their culture that their feelings for each other are perfectly acceptable. Mm. So, so it, yeah, it created some interesting side, it, you know, things that aren't the main story, but yeah. interesting dynamics without it being, it's not a story about gay love. It's not a story about same sex relationships. It's a story that takes place in a world where those things are normal. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's cool. And so now it sounds like you've developed quite a um, culturally and structurally complex world. How do you mm -hmm. keep it all straight and organized? It's all in my head. Is I it? have, yeah, I mean, I know I'm, the older I get, the more I think, oh my heavens, am I ever going to remember this? I seriously, I just keep it, I don't have a story Bible. I just keep it all in my head. Now I do have electronic versions, of course, of my books on my computer. And every so often I'll think, okay, I need to go back to this vault, this book and check a fact. Hmm. But 90% of the time, I know exactly where it is in the book that I'm needing to check. Wow. And it's just a really quick matter of search function. Yeah. yeah. I mean, now my husband would tell you that I live in this world and that that's <laughs> because I don't know where anything is in my own house. And I can't remember <laughs> you know, what it is I'm supposed to be doing 10 minutes from now, but right. ask me ask me a fact from one of the earlier books and I'll tell you immediately. So. Yeah. Wow. That is so amazing to me because I cannot remember anything <laughs> about when I'm writing, you know, I'm writing, you know, book in book three and I have to go back and check in book one to make sure that I didn't change somebody's name or something like that. So I commend yeah. you for, for writing such a complex world. I, yeah, I, I realize I seem to be an outlier in this, but it's, uh, it's there. I mean, Hey, don't ask, but as I said, don't ask me anything else about the real world. <laughs> that's that's great. I love that you're able to do that. Um, so now you, um, when you approached me, um, you had mentioned that obviously that your books don't have magic in them. Um, mm -hmm. And you talked a little bit about the subgenre and we've been talking a lot about subgenre um, in this season of the podcast. And so I'd like to know kind of, um, you have a fantasy world without magic. 
Um, is it historical fantasy? Is it alternative history? How do you categorize your works? Well, when I'm filling things in on Amazon, I use both categories. <laughs> right. um, I probably would call them historical fantasy mostly, but I have been told by a fairly well-known big name, biggish name fantasy writer who gave me a really nice review of Empire's Daughter that it was definitely not fantasy. Mm. <laughs> so, okay. No magic, no fantasy. Mm. So I tend to, personally, I call them um, historical fiction of another world. Okay. And I will then emphasize to people that they read like fantasy, but they feel uh, feel like a, feel like history, mm. which I've been told by many people that they do feel like history. Right. Um, I would still tend towards calling them historical fantasy and argue with people who say that fantasy has to have magic. But in my world, the fantasy is the societies. Okay. Um, more than, you know, so that they're speculative fiction is really what they are. Yeah. But right. That's such a broad term. And so how did, what made you decide to create this world that's fantastical um, without magic? And how do you continue to keep the world fantastical, even though it doesn't have magic? Um, I didn't figure I was capable of writing a consistent magic system okay. or working out, uh, how it worked and I don't like magic systems that don't seem to have some reasonable non-causal science behind them, let's right. put it that way. Yeah. Um, I, I want magic systems to work and maybe I'm too much of a trained scientist to be able to take that step away and say, okay, I can build a magic system because mm. I think it would just turn into some sort of physics or something. <laughs> um, so, and I also, secondly to that, it goes really comes back to the theme of the overall theme of the books is I didn't want there to be an easy way out. And sometimes magical systems are easy way outs. Mm. Now, I, you know, most writers say, well, there is a price for magic that is being paid. Right. But I still didn't want there to be that sort of, okay, I can solve this by, you know, by some magical means. I wanted Lena and the other because not all the books have Lena as the first person voice. I didn't want any of the characters to be able to escape. They needed to do it through their own uh, mind and will and, yeah. and person and character. Gotcha. So those were the two reasons. Yeah. Okay. And so are there um, comparable works to your series that don't have magic that um, readers kind of go into looking for? Not that I know of. Okay. <laughs> and I'll be completely honest on yeah. that. I, I've never come across books quite like them. Um, the the closest that would come would be Guy Gabriel Kay's later books where magic takes less and less of a, as, a, as they get further away, as, as you get closer to modern day, there is less, less magic in them. Okay. Um, and that would be the closest I could come, but. Yeah. And so where do your readers usually come from? Do they come from, you know, other fantasy, you know, epic fantasy worlds that, you know, maybe they're looking for, for political and cultural differences or are they coming from historical fantasy? They're mostly coming from historical, historical yeah. fiction, fiction. Yeah. But, yeah, historical fiction readers, which, yeah, I, and another really interesting thing about I found is that, you know, when I started writing Empire Star, I actually started writing as a young adult book and figuring that I was, looking for an audience in their 20s maybe you know young mm -hmm. sort of new adult mm -hmm. my demographic is is over 50 okay and um both women and men but almost almost all my readers are over 50. Hmm. so i don't know what that means <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i wouldn't be surprised if you know that's the crossover of historical fiction as well people looking for uh for that feel yeah, works. and I think it may may also have to do with my writing style. I mean, okay. I am, you know, I, I basically learned my craft from people like Mary Stewart, uh, reading her books, and I probably, they are probably slower paced mm. than um, the taste is for a lot of younger readers, so. Okay, and like, so how would you compare your books to something like um, Game of Thrones, where I mean, there's obviously magic, but there's also that political and cultural aspects built into those books as well. I suppose politically and culturally, um, they have a, they do have some things in common. They're not as complex. I don't have a, quite as large a set of characters. <laughs> yes, right. Game of Thrones, but Game of Thrones, as you know, is roughly based on the War of the 
toes as the cousins yeah. were. And, you know, seriously, I'm the same way. I'm roughly basing these books on a period of, of existing history and pulling things from uh, a period of about 600 years and not necessarily putting them in the same order as they really happened. But yeah, if you took the magic and the dragons out of, out of um, Game of Thrones and didn't make them quite as dark um, and as quite as many sets of characters, because I really only have four main characters until we get into the last two books and then there's one more. Um, they're not dissimilar, I suppose. Okay. But, but... One, something one of my readers said to me, and I, I agree with him on this, is that he said, the thing I notice about your books is that all your characters are really kind to each other. Hmm. And I think that is true. There is they, One of the underlying messages, I suppose, is that if we just talk to each other more, we would understand things better. Right. And there would be less conflict. And that is true. You know, there, there's a lot of emphasis put on the on negotiation, on on diplomacy as mm. a way to get uh, past things, rather than immediately reaching for a, a sword. Right. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, and I think the you know the reason for me asking, obviously, is you know if someone is a fan of epic fantasy, and maybe they're a fan of epic fantasy because of the, you know, the cultural structures, the political maneuverings and that, which is, I mean, sometimes you read epic fantasy with extremely low magic. There might be a mm -hmm. magic in the world, but it's maybe referenced and not you really used to, for the yeah. plot, at least, um, that maybe your books are something that they would still be interested in, even without the magic. I think that's reasonable. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if you're not reading the story for the battles, but for the cultural and political maneuvering and, and the development. Yes. But if you're looking for battles, I'm not the right person. <laughs> I have, there's a bit of fighting in almost all of them, but it's not a lot. Right. So. Yeah. Okay. That's great though. Um, so tell me a little bit about, um, so you've told me a bit about the world you've created already, but can you tell me a little bit how creating a secondary world like this um, enabled you to do things that just writing a historical fiction book wouldn't have allowed you to do? Yeah, uh, two things, mostly. One is what I've already alluded to, is it allowed me to create a so social structures that just didn't exist. Yeah. And um, it allowed me to put women into much more uh, prominent roles than is commonly thought to have happened. Although in, if you actually dig down into the history, you do discover that through either their bloodlines or their involvement in the church, there were a lot of very po positive women. And that was another thing. There is no organized religion in my books. I left okay. that. I just left that out completely. It was mm -hmm. just a complication I did not want to get into. So while there are people who are locally devout and, and religions are personal, faith is personal. There is no... Christianity versus the pagan bit at all. Right. Um, so that allowed me to do that. It allowed me to remove organized religion completely from the from the uh, world, the whole culture and world view and conflict view. Uh, it allowed me to put women in more prominent roles, uh, and it allowed me to create a society societies where sexuality is expressed differently than it was at the time, or right. that we believe it was at the time. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so when you went into the story um, and did you realize, I guess, while you were creating the world that this was a subgenre that was not a mainstream subgenre that uh, like, did you consciously not put magic in it just for just because you didn't want magic or was it just something that was, you know, just a, just what you wanted to write. So you wrote it. Yeah, it was what I wanted to write, so I wrote. You know, the, the saying, "Read the books you want, write the books you want to read." Yeah, well, that's what I did. <laughs> yeah, that's great, though. Um, so yeah, so there was never a question of if there would be magic involved or no. not. Yeah. And so, what was the most difficult part of creating the world then? Uh, the most difficult part of creating the world is figuring out which bits of real history to use and which bits of real history not to use, and 
how to change the history to suit my purposes, but still sound familiar to people. So an example of that would be uh, in the later books is the palace guard. I basically took the concept of the Roman Praetorian Guard. Okay. A little bit of the concept of the um, Swiss Guard that guards the Vatican. And sort of took both concepts, mostly Praetorian, but and combined them into a guard force in my city of Castle that isn't the Praetorian Guard, and it isn't the Swiss Guard, it, but it is a palace guard that has a lot in common with mostly the Praetorian Guard. Hmm. Um, but I didn't nitpick it down to the details. I And it's out of time too, because the Praetorian Guard was much earlier in Rome's history than, than I am sort of reflecting. So, so it was, it's, that was the hardest piece um, was just deciding what to use and what not to use. And realizing very early on that I didn't have to stick to a historical timeline because I'm not writing history. So yeah. the final battle in the third book of the first trilogy actually is based on a battle, that Battle of Malden that took place in England in around the year 1000. Okay. But in my book, uh, not only did I change how it, the outcome of the battle, but um, it's if, you know, if you were trying to figure out when in the timeline it was happening, it would be several hundred years earlier. I just liked the battle. It was useful. So... So I borrowed it um, and that, so yeah, that was be the, the, the most complex thing. And the other thing was keeping, making sure that I kept the technology and the medicine and a few other things uh, believable, although they're not accurate. I will say that a lot of it is, is not accurate to the times, but it's believable to the times. Okay. And so have you always had a fascination with history and an interest in history to, to kind of build this experience on? Yeah, I grew up in a house where history was taken very seriously. My father's, my father's love was Tudor history and, okay. and a, little, a little later was Plantagenet history. And so there were as many history books in our house as there were anything else. Mm. And I still could tell you pretty much a good chunk of Tudor history and a little less of Plantagenet, but somewhere along the line, I segue to, and I believe it's probably to do with my late teens fascination with King Arthur, late mm -hmm. teens, early twenties. I segued off into sort of what would have been called dark ages history in, in, uh, in Britain. And then Actually, through Mary, well, through a couple of books, Rosemary Sutcliffe's *The Eagle of the Ninth* was definitely one of them, and then Mary Stewart's Merlin trilogy, where she begins that series in a crumbling Roman villa, and started my interest in okay, just what was left after Rome left. Okay, and so, so but the short answer is yes and i my first the first degree i started which i never finished was actually in history oh, my sister okay. has a history degree so now yeah <laughs> we're a, a house of historians yeah rich rich history interest in the family which is great i love that and so how much time do you spend on research now as you're writing your works Ooh, more and more yeah um when i started writing the first two two books two and a half, I basically was writing about history I knew about. Hmm. I had to look a few things up. Like I said, I had to research about the Malden to make sure I knew, but I had the background. I knew what I was writing about. And then like partway through the third book, we end up in what is now my Rome analog. And I'd never been to Rome. Right. So I did a ton of research on that. And then I went to Rome, which is, was necessary because I needed it for another one of the books. And so as the books progressed, I ended up doing more and more work, research around Rome and Byzantium history, because that wasn't my interest. My interest was post-Roman. Mm. And then uh, also more about, more, um, about Viking history. Oh. Um, I actually took a university course um, on European medieval history um, to as part of, but my focus was on Viking history because I, I needed to know a lot more about that too. And then 
Kat Jarman's wonderful book, River Kings, was a real help in that mm. as well. So more and more research. And what I, at the point I'm at now, finishing this eighth book, knowing I think where I'm going after this, I have a ton of research to do in the next year or two. Right. So Yeah, that all sounds so fascinating to me. And it sounds like, it sounds like, You've got really interesting work ahead of you. <laughs> but I love doing research, so yeah. it's not work. I just love reading work and thinking, oh, what could I do with this? Mm. When it's, it, ideas come when I'm reading. I was reading uh, Gita Baudelaire's book, Praetorian, when I was working on Empress and Soldier. And it was just the ideas as I was reading that just came like that. And I live right across the road from my university's my university okay i still have alumni privileges at the library nice. and i haunt the history floor the years of pandemic when i couldn't they closed the library to the alumni oh, yeah oh it drove me nuts oh yeah i bet <laughs> i bet yeah especially if you're trying to work on a project that that you need yeah. access to the text and, for. and it was expensive i had to buy the books and <laughs> Yeah. I would borrow them. Yeah, those those aren't cheap either if you're no. buying textbooks. So what themes do you gravitate towards in your writing? I know you touched a little bit on this earlier, um, but are there certain themes that you really try to bring across in the books? Yeah, the, the there's two or three really big ones. And one of them, which goes, as I alluded to earlier, goes back to the book that I started to write when I was 17, the great Canadian novel. Um, <laughs> is about the relationship between people in the land in which they live hmm. and the importance of place and, in creating people and in creating culture and in creating a love for their land and their country. And that runs through the entire series, that we do things because we love the land on which we live hmm. on both a very local level and on a larger level. Okay. Um, the second one... I've already alluded to as well is about um, about the power of communication and understanding and love to get past conflict. That was another important one. And then the third one is really a thread about personal responsibility, about um, what we, how we, how we choose to respond to events. Um, defines who we are and um yeah. that's there's a quote <laughs> you think i'd know my own quote but i don't um one of the generals says very early on to lena that concept that um we can't let's see if i can remember it we can't change the circumstances to fit our lives only the lie our lives to fit the circumstances hmm. And how we respond to those circumstances is what defines us. So that is really runs through the entire series. Yeah. Okay. That's great. And, you know, um, I guess in regards to the theme around, you know, uh, the love of the land, that's a very, seems like a very Canadian theme to have in Canadian literature. Doesn't it? <laughs> it's a hard thing flashbacks to my Canadian literature classes in university. And uh, <laughs> Margaret Atwood's uh, book which was really all about that yes <laughs> surfacing i couldn't yeah. remember his name ever yeah. yeah yeah it is a very canadian theme yeah. i have to say <laughs> <laughs> but, but but that's i mean that is great and that you're bringing it in into a uh genre that that wouldn't typically see you wouldn't typically see in canadian a lot of canadian literature mm. yeah um now how about characters in your series do you have a character that's your favorite to write and uh what makes them special Oh, I have now I have a character who's my favorite to write, but he's not necessarily my favorite character. Okay. So those may be two different things. The character who I love writing the most is my Roman soldier. Sorry, my Castellani soldier, Drusius. And I love writing Drus because he is a man of very few words. And he is also a man non-reflective about what about his life or apparently so. And so he was a real challenge to write because I wrote him in first, he insisted on being written in first person present, mm -hmm. which was an interesting voice. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a challenge to write someone who isn't self-reflective and isn't, doesn't say a lot um, and get across what they are thinking and feeling. Right. 
So I loved the challenge he gave him. And interestingly, I found him very easy to write hmm. uh, once I allowed him the voice that he wanted. Okay. Um, but, and he has some huge fans who would tell you that he is the best character I have ever written. Hmm. And then I have other people who say, I don't understand him at all. So he's one of these very polarizing characters. Right. My personal favorite character, which oddly enough is not Lena, even though she's been in, living in my head for 25 years or more now, is Sorley. And Sorley is my favorite character, I think, for several reasons. One is he's the most vulnerable uh, and expresses that vulnerability and uh, more than the others. And this other one is plainly that he's the musician. He's the bard. And I have the musical intelligence of a gnat and that's probably being bad to the gnat <laughs> and i always 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 wanted to be able to sing and to play a guitar and i could do neither i cannot carry a tune for the life of me and i can't tell if guitar is out of tune <laughs> no, it's that bad so i think sorely is a big piece of wish fulfillment for me mm, right so. <laughs> oh, i love that I, I love the the rich um complexity you it sounds like you have built in your worlds, but between your characters and the culture and the history, it all sounds great. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And so what can readers expect as they read your series? What kind of emotional impact do you hope to have on them? I think that you need to be prepared to be hurt. You're going to experience pain. You're going to experience very deep love, um, loss, uh, fear, um, but I'm hoping that running through all of it is this, this is a love story on many levels. I'm really hoping that that sense of what holds these four people together and what guides their decisions are, is, is love, whether it's for their land or for each other in some format. That's what's, that's what's happening. And that's what I'm hoping people get out of it. So what can readers expect from you next? I know that you have book eight coming out in February, you said. How many how many books are planned and are you working on anything else? Yeah. Okay, so book eight, Empire's Passing, is the last book in the contiguous series. Um, there's actually seven books in the contiguous series once Passing is out. Empress and Soldier is a side project, I would say, like it's the same world, the same characters, but you do not need to read it and you can read it without having read any of the others. It doesn't, it's sort of this additional volume that I wrote because someone said to me, why don't you write more about, write me Drusius's backstory. And I said, oh, I thought, oh, all right, that'll be a nice little novella that will keep me occupied until I'm ready to write Empire's Passing because I knew that was going to be a difficult book to write. Hmm. So I thought, okay, it'll take me a few months. I'll write this novella about Drusius. Uh, yeah, right. Turned into an entire novel, um, which took a year, but that's fine. I mean, and so Empire's Passing is the last contiguous book in the series, and it does take the series full circle. That goes back to Lena as as the main, one of the two main characters, her voice again. She's the first person voice again. I'm not saying there won't be other books set between the first book and the last book, but I'm not writing anything beyond it. Touch wood. Uh, <laughs> I never say never, right? Right, but, exactly. But what is in the very early planning stages is a book, books, books, who knows, set in the same world 500 years later. Wow. So around the 13th, 14th century. Okay. Um, with some tenuous connection to the this right. series. So, yeah. but I'm really early on just beginning to think about that. So that's, that's awesome. I, I love that you've, you've built this universe and you're continuing on in it. So I don't think it's going to let me go. Yeah. I, it's interesting. I write short stories for a um, online magazine, basically called the Muse Bush. And they're, they're prompts that we're given every month. And I, and I, uh, write to them and sometimes they're just excerpts from the books because mm. i don't have time to write something new but right. but almost all my short stories are urban fantasy oh really and they actually have magic in them and things okay. like that yeah but i can't see ever doing it as a as a book oh really as a novel i'm not sure i could can i can do it for a thousand or fifteen hundred words i don't right. think i can 
maintain it. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, too, I, I mean, once you have, um, I mean, this, this epic series that is demanding more to be written of it, I mean, you have to kind of focus on with the time you have, right, to, uh, mm -hmm. to work, because I know my, I mean, the time in the day is limited, so you've got to You've got to put your words where you need them, right? It's true. And, yeah. you know, I am 65 and the energy is not what it was even five years ago. I used to write between uh, sort of nine o'clock and one or two o'clock in the morning. Mm. It was my oh, wow. standard writing time. Yeah. And then I'd be up again, you know, next morning relatively early and doing other things. I wow. can't, couldn't do that now. Well, I couldn't, there. I couldn't do that either right now. <laughs> anyway, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> So my writing, yeah, my writing time is, you know, 5 a.m. To, to, you know, 7.30 or so. That's usually mm -hmm. when I get my words in. But yeah. Is that before work? It's before work. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. I yeah. remember being there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the head isn't quite there after work. I, I was trying to yeah. do them, you know, evening and that sort of thing. And um, I've got to get I've got to get in there while, while the brain's still fresh. Well, that's why Empire's Daughter took me 15 years to write. Mm. Because I was being written around work and taking care of my elderly parents and right all the other things that happen right it, life it was being it was being written around life i exactly. only wrote managed to get the next seven written in eight years because i retired <laughs> so. yeah yeah well uh well marianne this is the greatest podcast in the multiverse can you tell us about how in a parallel universe a different choice might have shaped another version of your life yeah i can <laughs> that's um, I will go back to my focus on landscape and place. And in another world, if I had, if the British television show Time Team had started a decade before it did, I would be a landscape archaeologist. Oh, really? It is my, one of my honest passions in life. Hmm. And um, I've actually taken university courses in it since I retired. I love landscape history and landscape archaeology. And I would have, had I known you could be a landscape archaeologist, I would have been a landscape archaeologist. Wow. But I, I didn't know you could be. Yeah. Didn't know it existed. Can you tell us, because um, I am I could take a good guess, but can you tell us a little bit more about what that actually is? So a landscape historian slash archaeologist is someone who studies the landscape, both in its physical form and on old maps and and uh, aerial surveys and things like that, looking for uh, things that tell you about the history. Now, I have to say that in North America, it's, you know, there's not, there's not a lot. Right. I spend my winters in Britain, um, or well, I did pre-pandemic and I will, did this last year and I will be again. And it's basically, you're walking along and you're looking for things, and I do this all the time, uh, you're looking for things that say that a thousand years ago, this was a, this was a, a boundary of some sort. And what was it a boundary between? Was it, you know, was it a property boundary? Hmm. So you're looking, you're looking for dips in the landscape. You're looking for lumps and bumps is okay. how it's often described. <laughs> and I use it in, well, I use it many places, but in uh, Empire's Exile, the third book, uh, a character sees the traces of what is a quote unquote Roman road, a mm. Casalani road in the landscape, the way that you can see tr traces of Roman roads in Britain. Okay. So, yeah. So basically you're just, you're looking for evidence of the past in the man human made landscape and where, how that translates um, into interpreting how the landscape was used, how the landscape itself influences the history of that area. That sounds absolutely fascinating. It is. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing. Um, yeah. Can you tell our listeners how they can find you and where they can get your books? Yeah. I mean, my website is marianelthorpe.com. That's pretty simple. My books are widely available on all platforms, Amazon, Kobo, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Where I would really like people to go and buy them if they don't live in Guelph, Ontario, where they can buy them from me or from the bookshelf, which is our wonderful independent bookstore downtown. And I'll give that a shout out because it is wonderful, is an online bookstore called Scarlet Ferret. Okay. Um, and if you buy them from Scarlet Ferret, you get all sorts of little extras, digital extras, oh. uh, little extra short stories, little extra poems, various things that you don't get anywhere else. And they're a nice alternative to Amazon. That's great. I will, uh, yeah. I will make sure to link that in the show notes for people who are wanting to check that out. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, Marion. It has been a real blast chatting with you today. And thank you, Herman. Really interesting. And uh, I hope we get to chat again. Okay, great. Thanks so much. All right. Take care. Thank you for joining me. If you enjoyed the show, like and subscribe on your favorite podcast app or on YouTube. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Greatest Podcast in the Multiverse. As well, you can help support the show by supporting me on Patreon. For as little as $5 a month, you can get early access to the show as well as submit your questions for my upcoming guests. I hope to see you next time. Bye now.